Thank you for the introduction. And uh, well, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, give a talk today. So I want to talk about this project that is about some pretty surprising and interesting connection between 3D dynamics and in particular another flows and some uh, medieval domains that are not going to uh, And so something that comes from symplectic geometry. And she will say that this uh, is partly joined with uh, all the bazaar, I think I was still right And so the goal, well, I think there are two main goals. The first one is to uh, well, understand how to construct from these and other flows, these little structures. And to understand uh, how to well defined with the structures, so well defined up to uh, And the second goal is to, to study the, the symplectic invariance. Like symplectic homology of the Rock Fukai category of these uh, dual structures. So maybe I'll, I'll start with. Uh, defining some of the terms in this title, and I will start at the end. So uh, I'll give a domain is usually a, a triple where V is some compact manifold, uh, even dimensional, uh, Boundary uh, omega is a is a two form. It's equal to d lambda. Lambda is a one form, and it's a symplectic form, which in that case just means that omega is non-degenerate. And this non-degeneracy implies that. We can define a vector field by this formula, and this vector field Z is called the neural vector field. And we want this vector field to be positively transverse to the boundary. So here, the, the data of the symplectic form induces a volume form, so an orientation on V. And uh, here I mean positively transverse uh, with respect to this orientation. And the, this canonical picture to draw is the following thing where this is my V, the boundary uh, is usually denoted by M, and this is my dual vector field that's pointing outward. And once we have that, there is a, a way to extend it to complete this manifold by adding something that looks like R plus cross. M and the extension of this lambda the uval form is going to be exponential s times alpha, where alpha is the restriction of lambda to this boundary, and this is to the simplification of the contact manifold M, the contact form alpha. And this new object that has no boundary, we call it a uval manifold. And to be more precise, it's a uval manifold of finite type. I will only care about the of to find a type today. Um, respect is like a uh, we made it smoothly funny. So a priori you could have, you know, uh, in uh, a legal manifold, I think it's not necessarily conical at infinity. Uh, but if it is, then it's a finite type. I see. I see. So just something that is the completion of a domain. Yes, it's okay. actually, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. That's uh, the torture way. Okay, and um, so now let me define uh, the, this, this term one steam one steam domain is it's a legal domain. Uh, 
in specific kind with an extra piece of data that is some uh, Morse Lapuna function. Or Z. Or maybe another way to say it is that Z is a grain like vector field for some Morse function. And uh, in particular, I think Weinstein defined Weinstein domains by handling them from what's called Weinstein handles. Uh, and these Weinstein handles. Have the property that the core is isotropic, and so the index of the handle is at most n, half of the dimension. Um, and so that's a strong topological restriction on Weinstein domains. And in particular, provided that n is at least two, the boundary of V is connected. So you would need two n minus one uh, handles to. Be able to have a distinctive boundary. Um, okay. And so maybe I can also say that there is a correspondence between Weinstein domains or manifolds and it's called the Stein manifolds coming from complex geometry. Um, and Weinstein manifolds are also related to left of vibration. So there is a rich theory for, for these manifolds. You know what else? Today, I want to uh, try to study some non Weinstein visual manifolds. So, well, what about them? The first construction was due to McGuff in 91, and it's a pretty cool construction. Um, and so, it is as follows Sigma is some closed oriented surface of genus at least two. And if you look at the cotangent bundle of sigma, uh, this has a synthetic form, a canonical synthetic form, uh, even a dual form. But now, if we remove the zero section, I think that at least smoothly looks like R times the unit potential bundle of sigma. And Magdev constructed a dual form on this uh, manifold. And this manifold has two ends. So the corresponding domain will have disconnected ends. And the way to do that is, uh, is the following. There is this canonical dual form uh, giving this canonical symplectic form. And if you add the pullback of some so, uh, have this projection to the base. We pull back up some array of form for, let's say, some hyperbolic metric on sigma. That's a simple form, but away from the zero section, it's exact. And what happens in this construction is that for this new legal form, the legal vector field, so away at infinity, it's as before, it's pointing outwards. But when you get closer to the zero section, the usual certainly starts pointing inwards. And it would point towards the zero section, near the zero section. Uh, so maybe a, a sketch in dimension lower. So this is the usual picture, I guess. So the zero section, but now for this uh, form, similarly, you have. Looking at this, so if, if you remove some neighborhood of the zero section and maybe you remove also the neighborhood of infinity, you get this domain that here looks disconnected, but one dimension higher, it's not disconnected anymore, and it looks like this. Um, okay. Why does it point in when you're close to the? Sorry? Why does it point towards the zero section? Uh, is, that is that some obvious way to see that? I. I think it's obvious if you write it in coordinates, maybe. Okay. But I'm, I'm not going to do that. That's fine. <laughs> I mean, there is another way to, to look at it. Uh, just so, just so. 
interesting. Is it like that it that it goes to the geodesic flow? Like it sort of has a geodesic flow component in the, the little Yeah, question. so it will interpolate between between two things. Uh, Anyway, I'm assuming your thing is going to be a generalization to this, right? So yes, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you'll see why in a minute. So, so these examples were generalized by Guy Guess in round 95, uh, but it gives a completely different construction, much more algebraic. Uh, so, if you, if you look at these two uh, B groups. Uh, SL2R of the units to cover SL2R and the sole group. So these two things are essentially L3. And Geiges constructs uh, for these both of these examples pairs of contact forms uh, with opposite orientations. And so that if you look at one minus t times alpha minus plus one plus t times alpha plus, this is a one form one minus one one plus one of these guys, this is dual. So, I mean, this is not compact, this is R3, but you can take quotients of that. And this pair is actually invariant by the action of the group. And, and this, uh, you know, some suitable quotient of SL2R is gonna give you the unit contingent model of the hyperbolic surface, and that recovers Amount of examples that gives more because you can take further quotients uh, that are three manifolds. And this, um, the closed quotients of this looks like the torus bundle over S1 and the monogamy is given by some matrix in SL2Z that is hyperbolic. Meaning that the trace this matrix. Okay. And now I think you can start seeing the, the NASA flow lurking in the background. And it's not at the same time. And it's true that actually there is an even more general construction starting from some volume preserving NASA flow. So for a volume preserving it as a flow on, on some oriented three manifold, we construct again a pair of contact forms that before, so that one minus t alpha minus plus one plus t. So this linear interpolation is dual on minus one one cross m. And here in the MEDEF example, the volume preserving flow is. It's almost a geodesic flow, but not flow. And in this case, it's given by the suspension of this analysis of diffeomorphism uh, of the torus. Oh, what is the second group set? Sol three. Um, that's uh, like corresponding to solved geometry, I guess. Uh, so it's some kind of semi-direct product of R two with R, I believe. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact formula, but it's something fairly simple. Um, okay, and even more recently, Serena Hozuri, uh, so I think the first version of the paper in Archive from 2020, generalized it and essentially removed the volume preserving assumptions. So, So for any another flow, there exists a pair of contacts from like this, giving you a, a dual form. And actually, it proves more than that. It gives a characterization of another flows in terms of suitable pairs of contact forms satisfying some dual condition. Um, I should also say that Gagas also has, so all these examples. What was the second thing that you said? I'm sorry? What was the second thing you said that was already did? So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But he showed that it gives it gave a characterization of the NASA flows in terms of the existence of suitable pairs of contact forms. But I'll give a more precise statement in a minute. Okay. Um, so all of these examples are four-dimensional. We get four-dimensional domains. 
Gaius also constructed six dimensional domains, still of the form minus one, one cross some uh, manifold. And um, Masson, Krieger, and Wendel produced examples in, in any uh, dimension. So for any odd dimension, they construct some manifold of this dimension, M, so that minus one, one cross M has such a level structure. Uh, but here I'm going to restrict to uh, examples in dimension four. Yes. So is there construction also with some starting with a hyperbolic, like a, a subflow, or is it a, like a hyperbolic? Uh, can, can is there construction similar yes. to starting with some Anisov flow, but just maybe more restrictive than what, whatever is already did? Um, so I mean, there is a there is a fairly explicit construction of these legal structures from the Anisov flow. I'll ask after. Actually. Okay, sure. Yeah, don't don't worry about um, All right. Yes. So the only way you know these are not Weinstein is because they have more than one boundary. Yeah, it's um, because they have the wrong topology essentially. Okay, but if they did have the right topology, can you say anything whether these can be Weinstein or not? Oh, that's a, I think it's usually, I don't know any example of a manifold that has the topology of something that could be Weinstein. Uh, so a Morse type at most N that doesn't have Weinstein structure. Okay. I think the only cases where we know that the manifold is not, does not have a Weinstein structure is because of this topological uh, yeah, just the, the homology is too big, or something like that. Yes. okay. Um, all right. Okay. So let me erase everything. And so I still have to define what an analysis flow is. So I'll do it now. So this is the first part, the Nazov, and also let's go projectively and projectively a Nazov flows. And only in dimension three. So M is going to be some closed empty manifold. And my flow phi, watching on the map phi t, um, I'll assume that it's non singular and is generated by. So you can say C1, maybe C infinity, vector field, X. So being non-singular means that X doesn't vanish. Um, I mean, pretty much everything I'm gonna say works for the C1 flow, but since I want smooth level structures in the end, uh, I will maybe assume that my flow is, is smooth. And C, so okay. Is enough if uh, there is just a splitting of the tangent space as it kisses the direction of the flow, which is given by x, some unstable direction and some stable direction. So this is a continuous uh, invariant splitting. And along this direction ES, the flow is exponentially contracting. And along this direction PU, it's exponentially um, uh, expanding. So that means that there exists some metric, or actually for every metric, uh, on M, there exists some constants C and A, so that if you pick a vector in ES, and sometimes T, and look at the applied differential of the flow to this vector V, the stable direction is going to be smaller than C exponential minus AT times the normal V. And in stable direction, you'll have that this is at least C times exponential AT times V. Uh, 
So this is called an hyperbolic splitting. The S is the strong stable direction, U the strong unstable direction. Um, and now I've showed that these two uh, one-dimensional distributions are uniquely integrable, uh, which is non-trivial because uh, they are just continuous a priori. And then you can also define the weak stable direction by adding to the stable direction the direction of the flow and stimulating for the weak and stable direction. And well, in this case, in dimension three, uh, actually these two uh, plane distributions are C1. So they are a bit more regular. Uh, assuming that the flow is, let's say, or maybe it's just see good enough, and they integrate into two variations, two dimensional variation, uh, make stable and make unstable, and you have this important property that they are taught, which means that there is there exists some um, curve, some closed curve that is transverse to all the leaves. And this implies that any such curve transverse to the leaves is necessarily not contractible. So those transverse curves are not contractible. It's x fixed. Uh, yeah, here I'm fixing phi and x. So the, the, it's x fixed under the Anderson flow? Yeah, yeah, x is the, the vector field generating the flow. Okay. Yeah. So that's for Anasov. So I guess that was defined by Anasov in this case. Uh, it was generalization of hyperbolic, uh, well, of geodesic flows on a unit cotangent model of hyperbolic manifolds. And there is a closely related notion that is called projectively or conformally another. So, so phi is projectively or conformally another if instead of asking for the splitting for the tangent space, we only have a splitting of the tangent space mod the direction of the flow. And this is going to be the sum of the S and U. Uh, again, a continuous and invariant. So that now the flow expands more along EU than it does along ES. So that's also called the dominating splitting. Uh, so what you say is that there is this some, some metric G, alternate for every metric G. There is some constant C and A that if you pick a vector in this unstable direction, it is non zero. The vector in the stable direction, non zero, and some time t, then you will have that the norm if t and stable is at least c to t by t. Yes, t, t stable. And well, obviously, another implies projectively another, but the converse is certainly not true because projective then other flows exist on any uh, oriented free manifold. But if a, a free manifold has an another, carries an another flow, then its fundamental group has exponential growth. The mark probably is like that. So another flows tend to be a bit quite rare, although there is an abundance of them and there are different ways to construct them. And also in that case, so uh, yeah. is it is it known how rare an awesome flows are? Like which three methods carry this over which don't? I think it's a complicated question. I'm not an expert, but I seem to recall it was complicated. Yeah, I think it's, it's well, yeah. There are ways to construct them by doing some surgeries. But now understanding exactly which manifolds have another flows is hard. There are hyperbolic three manifolds with that another flows. Uh, so I think it's a fairly hard question. I don't really know. Uh, 
Okay, and in that case, it is not necessarily true that, um, okay, so you can define similarly the big stable and we can stable by just lifting these one dimensional bundles to get these two dimensional bundles and they're not necessarily integrable in that case. Uh, so they are more complicated to understand. Okay. And so this definition is due to Eliashwick and Thurston and also independently by Mitsumatsu because they actually put the, the same theorem in reference at the same time. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You said that there's a dominated splitting where? So for projectively a nozzle flow, the it's a dominated splitting of, of the tension bundle mod the direction of the flow. Something that I don't understand. So with the definition mm -hmm. for all sigma or sorry, so sigma sub u and or v sub u and v sub s, you have yeah. inequality. You don't say anything about the sum. Oh, sorry, they need to be uh, unit unit ah. vectors. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. So the theorem of Eliasberg Thurston and Mitsumatsu is that a flow, a non singular flow on a Fe manifold is projectively a Nazov if and only if it lies in the intersection of two contact structures with opposite orientations. So phi is projectively a Nazov if and only if it is supported. By a bi contact structure. Which is a spherix minus and C plus of contact forms, uh, contact distributions with opposite orientations and which are transverse anywhere. And here supported means that X is in this intersection. So that's a contact characterization of this projection in last flows. Can you comment on uh, how that, like you're saying, and also are projectively and also? Yes. But then you're saying that then and also should be supported by intersection of context. Projectively and also are. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. In, in particular, and also, also should be. No. Yes. Yes. But there is, there is a bit more than that, and it's exactly what I'm going to say now. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that these context structures are those uh, E almost uh, stable and unstable? No, no, no. These oh. so these ones are integrable. They are foliations, but these context structures are not integrable. That was my confusion. Yes, yeah. And but I'll tell you how to cook them, and, and you will see the relationship between between the two. So with Matsu did one direction, right? Then it's much in the easy part. I'm I'm not sure. I thought he did both, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, so why do you have the Ashberg person there? So so it's much. I think called them. I, I don't remember, but conformally or not? Yes, and Elijah McPherson were projected the all the opposite, uh, and. I think that they, they, they proved this theorem at the same time. And I think that Mitsumatsu proved both directions. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not sure I should. Uh... Mitsumatsu was before, because it was published, I think, around 95. And yes. So, so yeah, I'm not really sure about yeah, the. Yeah, the Ashbrook Thurston was a, a few years earlier. Maybe, yeah, maybe. But now there is a similar theorem due to Missouri, which is that phi is a Nazov if and only if it is supported by some by contact structure 
x minus x plus, but so far it's just projecting the amount of, but moreover, it should exist contact forms alpha minus and alpha plus for x minus x plus. Such that the following conditions are satisfied. One minus t alpha minus plus one plus t alpha plus. One plus t alpha plus and minus one minus t alpha minus plus one plus t alpha plus are both dual minus one one. So if project is in Azov is the same as a bike contact structure, then an Azov is the same as a bike contact structure together with suitable contact forms satisfying this legal condition. And so that was the, the, the characterization of Nazov flows that I was mentioning earlier. So is the R from minus R from flows on bike contact structure as well? Uh, yeah, so x minus x plus is a bike contact structure, is an alpha minus alpha plus or contact forms defining x minus x plus. Oh, defining, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so x minus the kernel of alpha minus x plus the kernel of plus. I should also say that um, I'm also going to assume that my projectively analysis or analysis flows are oriented, meaning that this bundle ES and EU are oriented. And also the orientation, uh, so the, the the orientation of ES and EU match this orientation given by the splitting. So there is some compatibility. Yes. So these are like non-deformation equivalent. Are these different? These are not. Are these not? Oh, these two here. Well, I, I don't think they are because here essentially what you're doing is that on one of the two ends you you reverse I guess they have the different contact form. I guess they have different contact forms at the end sort of yeah. different yeah. deformation classes. Yeah I mean they're essentially they look very similar but they're different yeah but they're I mean conceivably they're like in general two different global structures two fundamental yes. structures. Yeah. yeah okay yeah just can I sort of think of them as like the kind you know how when in the LAS group there's some construction they're sort of the two different top yes. perturbations yeah. Yeah. yeah okay so maybe the, the the intuitive reason why there are two conditions is that this condition will imply that the so we have a bicontact structure, so we are projectively an Azov. To say that projectively an Azov is an Azov, you it's enough to say that the unstable direction is actually expanding and the stable direction is actually contracting. And so one condition will imply the expansion and the other will imply the, the contraction. That's why there are two conditions. But it's it, it's important to have both. Okay. If you remove one, then, then it's not true. the theorem is not true anymore. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, but in some sense, this so this is a very nice correspondence, but it's only a correspondence, uh, you know, at, at the level of points. Meaning that if you have a flow, you get something like this, and you, if you have something like this, you get a flow. But what happens if you deform the flow, or what is the space of such pairs um, for a given flow, and Essentially, the, the question I have here is, is this legal structure or one of the two legal structures well-defined up to homotopy? The construction a priori depends on some choices, so it's not absolutely clear that we get well-defined legal structure, and it's not clear how it depends on the flow. Uh, so that's the question I want to address in my second part, but before that, I'll... So, so maybe the topology of the last of those through a bi contact lens. And so to, to, to answer these questions, how do the legal structures depend on the flow, uh, the, the first thing to do, I guess, is to slightly modify this theorem. Uh, and so let me write another condition, it's called prime, 
which is the following. So instead of looking at this linear interpolation, I want to look at this exponential um, interpolation between alpha minus and alpha plus. And the theorem is, so I cannot do copy paste on the blackboard, unfortunately, but the, replace this star with this star prime, and that's the theorem I proved. So you might say, well, look very similar. How is that new? How is it different? Uh, why is it a different theorem? So this, so morning, this condition star and this condition star prime are different conditions. So there exist pairs of contact forms satisfying star prime, but not satisfying star. Uh, which is actually fairly non-trivial, but it is true. And, and the reason why I prefer this of star prime is that, well, it turns out that it's a, it's a little bit easier. The computations are different. And it's also a definition that enjoys more symmetries. So, and yeah, I'll, I'll give a name to this. Neither of the implications are true, like between star and star prior. So, I expect that there is no implication at all, but I'm only able to find think satisfying star prime and not satisfying star, I guess. Uh, but I expect that, yeah, it's really two different conditions. So, so let me say that uh, the pair of contact forms is a legal pair if the S alpha minus plus E S is minus S alpha minus plus E S alpha plus is legal. And I'll say that it's uh, it's an Agnosov pair if both alpha minus alpha plus and minus alpha minus alpha plus are the pairs. So that's exactly uh, my condition start by. So doing some elementary linear algebra, it's possible to see that this condition here, that here I don't impose anything on the underlying contact structures. I'm not assuming that they're transverse, but actually they are. So an of evil pair plus gives a bicontact structure. Uh, we just have the kernels. And well, it's not true for a little pair, the odd little pairs, so that the kernels are not transverse. And, and so now I can define the space. pairs. And I can also define a map that is going to the space of another flows. So uh, another flows, but up to positive time of parameterization. So I'm only remembering the direction and not the parameterization. Uh, you can also think about it as fix some auxiliary metric G. This is the space of unit another vector fields. And this map, I'm going to call it I for intersection because that's exactly what it is. Take a minus and alpha plus here. We can send it to the intersection of the kernel of alpha minus, the kernel of alpha plus. That gives a one dimensional distribution. Take any vector field uh, spanning this distribution. It's an of by this theorem. And that's the result uh, of this map. So maybe, I don't know if I should call the, the class or uh, 
Okay, does it make sense? So, sorry, I'm not sure. I guess I'm confused because your theorem is sort of a different condition to get another, right? Yes. But if you use the two theorems, doesn't your condition imply the other condition and vice versa? Because you know, your condition implies another, then you use the other yes. theorem implies the other condition. So I'm confused. So my point is that the natural question is here is if I fix an another flow, what is the space of these pairs of contact forms? Ah, so the contact right. forms are do not need to be the same. I see. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, okay. That's why. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks. And okay. So and actually, here's my point. Uh, this map I is an acyclic. Definition which means that it's a, it's a vibration that is also a homotopy equivalent, uh, and that also implies that the fibers are contractible. So the space of the nasal real pairs supporting a given flow is contractible, and this is I I don't know how to show that for this definition here for star for the linear interpolation. It, the computations just don't work, but for this these exponential uh, interpolation, it works. And so in particular, that answers my, my earlier question. Uh, there is a well-defined dual structure up to homotopy. And moreover, if you have a path of another flows, then you can lift that to a path of dual structures through the path of another dual pairs. <laughs> So actually, there is a, a similar statement for bicontact structures. And so here, BC is the space of bicontact structures. There is a map that I'm going to do by the kernel, underlying kernel that is just what you think it is. Take an another legal pair and take the kernels. So here I have like base of another flows. Similarly, I can define the space of projectively another flows up to parameterization, positive time reparameterization. This is the map I, and this is. Well, essentially, you need the same map, take the intersection of C minus and C plus. And so not only I, but also PI for a cyclic so, relation. And another natural thing to look at is well, there is the image of. And also of the pairs by this map curve, which is the space of bicontact structures that you can realize as the kernels of the pairs. And there is also the pair, the space of bicontact structures supporting an, a nozzle flow. And well, ideally, we want these two things to be the same. They're not. It's a strict inclusion, but it's a homotopy equivalent. And so I guess here the, the, the slogan is that on this bottom line, you have another flows projected the another flows and the inclusion that's coming from dynamical systems. And on the top line, you have another legal pairs by contact structures and taking the kernel. And my point is that the topological properties of these spaces and the inclusion can be rephrased in terms of topological properties of these spaces and this map. That is just forgetting the contact forms and just remembering the kernels. And this uh, really leads in the contact world. There is no flow upstairs whatsoever. And I guess here for 
let's say to show that these two maps are acyclic self vibrations, the, the hard part is to show that the fibers are contractible too. Once you know that the fibers are contractible, all the rest follows from essentially uh, general, uh, uh, general facts in uh, homotopy theory. Other questions? And okay, maybe just let me tell you how to construct at least how to construct from an another flow, such as another VO pair or on the projected another flow of the contact structure. Uh, I'm essentially just going to draw a picture. So here is my vector field X, the another vector field is going this way, the stable and instable direction. And now fix some metric. Uh, I want my metric to be adapted, meaning that the constant C in the definition of the expansion and contraction is one, which means that the flow immediately contracts or immediately expands. So I take vector field spanning S and U, and I take them of norm one, and then I just tell them at 45 degrees. That gives me Xc minus Xc plus. So Xc plus and Xc minus are these lines plus the direction of the flow, but both contact structures. And moreover, um, the contact forms uh, Alpha minus and alpha plus can be constructed as, uh, constructed as follows. By dualizing ES and EU, you can get alpha S and alpha, alpha U, one forms. So the kernel of alpha S is E weak stable, weak unstable, and the kernel of alpha U is E weak stable. And by the because E weak stable and weak, E weak unstable are integrable. You should different, if you take the derivative of alpha s along the flow, you'll get a multiple of alpha s. And this multiple is some function rs. And the derivative of alpha u along x is going to be some function ru alpha u. And Mazzarini condition implies that rs is less than zero is less than R, ru. And Posuri calls these functions the expansion rate in the stable and stable direction. And now alpha minus, you can just define it as alpha u plus alpha s and alpha plus as alpha u minus alpha s. And then using that, we can essentially compute uh, you know, differential of alpha minus and alpha plus, and you can compute the Lewell form and check that it's actually a Lewell form. But here I have to choose a metric and uh, also, Already, these quantities are just C1. So I also need to smooth them in a suitable way. So that's why it's not completely obvious from the standard construction that you get something that is absolutely well defined. Yes. Is it easy to see psi minus and psi plus are contact? Uh, yes, because the flow is tangent to them, but the flow, it will push C plus in this direction and C minus in this direction. So the, the flow yeah. does not preserve them and push them immediately. And that implies the uh, non integrability. Yeah. And well, the, for the projectively and of case, the picture is the same. But for projectively and of, you don't have these inequalities here. You only have RU minus RS is positive. But RS and RU doesn't, they don't necessarily have a sign. And so that's not going to give you, uh, that's going to give you contact forms, but not necessarily satisfying these little conditions. Okay. So Exactly. Yeah. Another of you have the RU and RS. Yes. And if you get that inequality there, RS less than zero less than RU, that implies that it's an alpha, yes. right? Yeah. Because in that case, the, this dominant splitting would be uh, an actual hyperbolic ah, right. more or less. I mean, yes, yes. I mean, of course, this is just one possible construction. Maybe there is an, there are other ways of producing these pairs of contact from satisfying these conditions. And uh, that's why it's not necessarily trivial to understand the space of all these uh, pairs of contact forms. Okay. But so now let me focus on 
the legal structures that we obtain and the symplectic invariance. And so by another trivial manifold, I mean uh, a manifold from R plus M, where the dual form is exactly this type. And oh well, I will only have time to talk about uh, my favorite events, which is the wrapped Fukai category. This is defined for every dual domain. And okay, what is it? It's an A and T new category whose objects are exact cylindrical divergence plus extra adjectives. And the morphism spaces are given by the wrapped fuller coaching complexes between two Lagrangians, and the differential and anything structures are given by counting suitable uh, holomorphic strips, or holomorphic disks with boundary conditions and punctures. And uh, that's pretty much all I will say about wrapped category. But the First step to understand this object is to find the Lagrangians. So in the Weinstein case, the interest of Lagrangians given by the co-cores of the, the critical handles. So the, the handles of index M, and these co-cores are Lagrangian, exact Lagrangian disks. And it's known that these Lagrangian co cores they, um, well, they generate the wrap category. So, theorem of Chantren, Dimitri Gorizel, Eugenian Golovko, and also Gallant Rapan and Chandler. And so, in some sense, the, all the information is carried by these. Specific Lagrangians. And so if you understand these Lagrangian co cores URL, then you understand a lot about your Rafka category. What about the for these and other trivial manifolds? Well, we also have interesting Lagrangians that are fairly easy to construct. For any simple closed orbit, of another force, of course, here there is also some. Another flow um, in the background. And for any simple closed orbit of this, if you take the product of gamma r, you obtain uh, something that is denoted by L gamma. And this is an exact cylindrical uh, Lagrangian. Uh, it's even better than that. If you look at the little form restricted to it, you get zero. Essentially, because the tangent space to this gamma is spanned by the flow, and the flow lies in the kernel of alpha minus and alpha plus. What does simple mean there for closed orbit? Uh, it means that they're not multiple. Ah, uh, okay, okay, individual. Okay, 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 okay. Without a And the NASA flows have a lot of those. They have many, many, well, infinitely many. Simple closed orbit. So we get infinitely many Lagrangians. So that's great. And I'm going to go back to the not. It's the subcategory, the full subcategory of the category uh, containing those. And, and, and now the once you have your nice collection of Lagrangian, the second step usually is to uh, try to apply what is called Abuzay's criterion. That's a criterion that, if it's satisfied, will tell you that the Lagrangians split generate the Rafka category, which means that any other object can be realized as a summoned 
of the twisted complex of these objects. And the twisted complex is something you would obtain by taking iterative codes. So the wrap for category, as I defined it, it's not necessarily triangulated, but there is a way to, um, to enlarge it and make it triangulated and also add summons, uh, a direct summons. So I'm Zeke Richardin is as follows. If you look at some subcategory of a wrap for category, there is a map defined from the Horschel homology of this subcategory. It's called the open closed map to the symplectic cohomology, uh, well, plus some degree shift of, of the manifold. And well, I won't have time to define this map, but essentially it's counting suitable holomorphic cylinders. Some boundary punctures, interior punctures, uh, boundary conditions, but it's something counting holomorphic curves. In the symplectic cohomology, there is a particular element that is a unit and that lives in degree zero. And Abu Zayed's criterion tells us that if this open closed map hits the unit, then this is a collection B split generates. Split generates the whole category. And so if you understand this sub collection of Lagrangians very, very well, you understand the Rafa category very, very well as well. And, and there is also a, an extension of this term by Yanatra to say that if, in that case, if the open closed map is the unit, and moreover, the open closed map is an isomorphism, isomorphism and the Rafa Fugai category is called, is homologically smooth. Where homological smoothness is the property of infinite category means that the diagonal by module is split generated by Yoneda by modules. Uh, well, if you don't know about it, you can just forget what you said, I guess. <laughs> but it's known that for Weinstein domains, Abuzet's criterion is satisfied when we look at the collection of Lagrangian co cores, and in particular, the Raptor category of Weinstein domains. Uh, is homologically smooth. Uh, what is that for again? Sorry? Uh, the Ganatra is saying so open close is um so if Abuzet's pattern is satisfied, then open close is isomorphism. Oh, okay. And moreover, uh the right kind of category is homologically smooth. Yeah. So what happens in, in our another of dual case? Well, unfortunately. This subcategory double zero does not satisfy uh, Abuzaid's criterion. And over. The kernel is, is very large, it has infinite rank. So it's definitely not an isomorphism. Um, so this is a theorem joined with uh, Oleg and Agustin. Um, and here about, I can take the Z coefficients, take R coefficient, doesn't really matter. But more, is true, is true, and essentially this subcategory W naught is very large in the following sense. I'm going to say maximally non finitely generated, which means that if you take a sub collection, a subcategory of W naught, and you take an object in W naught with naught in the subcollection A, then L is not speed generated by A. So, in some sense, all these objects in W naught are independent of each other in the category. And this has some 
notable uh, applications, in particular, if gamma zero and gamma one are two different orbits, then L gamma zero and L gamma one are not isomorphic in the right category. And also, this W naught is not homologically smooth. The contrast with the one simple. Um, a way to think about W naught is uh, as follows the objects are coming from simple closed orbits. So you can look at the set of simple closed orbits of the flow. And in this way, we can endow it with the structure of an infinity category that is well defined up to quasi isomorphism. And actually, it only depends on the homotopy class of the another flow through another flows. And maybe I'll finish my question. A priori, this doesn't say anything about whether W0 did generate W. So actually, we don't know if, if this is true or not. And actually, we are not able to find exact Lagrangians that are not in the split closure of W0. We can construct, in some cases, interesting exact Lagrangians, but they are always uh, essentially geometrically coming from these cylinders over the orbits. So yeah, we, we, don't, we don't really know if there is a gap between W0 and W, or there are more other branches that we can see, uh, or if the orbits. You guys are three also. You can vote on it. What is the conjecture? Maybe it depends on the flow. I don't know. <laughs> so, but then, I mean, it's always possible to enlarge the replica category and to throw more objects by adding monotone Lagrangians, immersed Lagrangians with. Uh, I don't know, bounding code chains and, and uh, extra decorations. Uh, so I don't know, it would be nice if, if W not actually generate W because that would give an example of a wrap for category that is not homologically smooth. But as yeah, we can only understand this subcategory, we can only understand the subcategory uh, of the objects that we see. Uh, That's up here. Um, yes. So let's say you had like a a um, like an Anisov flow mm -hmm. on a contact manifold boundary uh, uh -huh. that had the where the home where like the basically like like the homotopy type of thing is such that if you cross with R. You get something that's not that that has the potential Weinstein. That have okay, like so the, the, the manifold you are starting with has boundary. Let's say you started with like an N self flow on something that had boundary, right? Okay. What is there? What's yeah. that? What is on the flow on a manifold that has boundary? Well, that's a good question. I mean, if could you? I guess you could say like it's the same as the N self flow. I mean, obviously the interior it should just be the same as before, right? But then I guess the question is what what kind of boundary compatibility are you asserting? I mean, are you assuming it's transverse to the boundary? I'm assuming yeah. it's in par it's tangent to the boundary. Probably. I think that it doesn't exist. It just yeah, doesn't exist. I think so. It's for dimension three. No. Yeah. It, it, I, I've seen a paper. I see. Uh, so this is just something that does not exist. Yeah. You have to um, impose some transversality condition on the boundary for, okay. for this to make sense. Yeah. Okay. So let's say it was not. Let's say it was transverse to boundary. Yeah. That that's that's something that exists. Uh, you, you, you can define that. I mean. I think in that case, it's better to define uh, axiom A flow, where you, you, you will say that inside of the manifold, you have some subset that is attracting and on which you have this hyperbolic splitting. Mm. Uh, OK, that's called a hyperbolic flow. Uh, yeah. OK. Um, I guess my question is, like, it seems like a natural what thing to do with this kind of thing would be to, like, Try to formulate one with a manifold for manifolds of boundary that did have a yes. homotopy type of one yes. thing, and then try to like prove that such a thing is like sort of 
as non Weinstein as possible in the sense. Although, that maybe, I mean, in, in, I don't know if these theorems would still hold because in many cases it's important to have a closed manifold. Like to, to say that if you have a bicontact structure, then it spans a projective the nozzle flow. Essentially, you want to look at C minus and C plus and flow them, and they will sort of converge to some foliation mm -hmm. or some bundle yeah. and flow them backwards, and they will converge to the other bundle. And that's why I guess. Uh, right, because you have a boundary, you cannot go. Yeah, 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 yeah. you cannot go back. Sure. Yeah. So here you're stuck. So. Okay, so this is really, I mean, you really think this is like kind of specific to the closed. Like, there is something specific, although I think it's. Maybe possible. You could like, pull things with boundary yeah. and then generate new stuff. So, so yeah. that's a way to do yeah. it. I mean, there, there are you know lots of results saying if you do this thing with boundary, you're gonna get to another flow, and maybe you can say something about those. Yeah. Your technique. Like pseudo NSI or something? Or no, you got another. Just an answer. Oh, for pseudo NSI, another. I mean, it's it's if you have something which is like you're saying, you know, it's an action A, and then plus other conditions, and how the glowing is. Then you can get things which are well. It's done for a nozzle because you know you do the smoothness stuff. But okay, well let's let's talk. Maybe we can talk more yes. about this particular question afterwards. It's an interesting question. Any other questions? So I I, I wanted to understand sort of your yeah, your last result. So yes. I don't know if I got it. So so you, if it was if that if I have all these conditions, then you have a lot a lot of nice things, right? Yes. You know. Uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. And what you prove is that it does not satisfy those conditions. Yes. That that's the content of this result. Yes. Okay. Right. Essentially, it does not satisfy this condition in the in the wildest possible way. Okay. All right. So life is hard. Yes. <laughs> that's what you prove. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, yes. uh, can you do you think you can detect you know basic invariants like entropy? So that's the uh, yeah, that's the next step, I guess, to, to really uh, see what information this, well, especially this W naught carries for the flow. And I mean, so far, I don't really know. It's for, tri for triangulated categories, you can define this categorical entropy with the shift operator. Yes. Or yes. Yeah. So I guess that would be interesting to see if this uh, recovers some uh, information about the flow. Yeah, that would be great. There are also questions that you can ask, like in between this projected the nozzle and the nozzle flows, you can ask if you have two nozzle flows uh, to be with a path through projected the nozzle flows. Does that imply that there exists also a path through the nozzle flows? And the way to detect the failure of that would be to look at these invariants because once you pass through projected the nozzle flows, you don't have these legal structures anymore. So maybe that could detect such things like that. Um, yeah, there is, I have to say there is one important piece that is missing so far in the picture, which is that nozzle flows, uh, well, usually the uh, equivalence relation that people look at from the nozzle flows is the topological equivalence. Two flows are topologically, topologically equivalent if there is a homeomorphism that sends the uh, trajectories of one to the other, to trajectories of the other, without uh, necessarily so respecting like equivalence, not topological conjugacy, or? Uh, so, I'm, I'm so confused with the terminology, but what I mean by topological equivalent means that there exists this homeomorphism sending trajectories to trajectories, but not necessarily respecting the parameterization. Okay, so yeah. equivalent. And that, I don't really know how it fits in this contact and splitting geometric picture. Uh, and maybe- um, even, There's nothing now along those lines. Um, I mean, for instance, a question that we have is, if you have two nozzle flows that are topologically equivalent and the topological equivalence is homotopic to the identity, this implies that the flows are homotopic as flows. <coughs> that seems to be uh, uh, not known in particular. I mean, I mean, there are results there. I think it's... Yeah, there are probably some results like this, but only partial results. It's homotopic. So if your orbit equivalence is homotopic to the identity, I think, I mean, dimension three, I think it's very rigid unless it's. Uh... But here, I would, I'm not assuming that this uh, topological equivalence is homotopic through topological equivalences. Or... Uh, well, I mean, there is a result of uh, 
say, you know, Bartholomew and yeah, you know about them. Do they have to assume transitive? Oh uh, yeah, they have transitive flows and they, uh, they have to assume transitive. Sorry? Do they have to assume transitive for the I think in the so in the, the Bartholomew and Mann paper, they assume that the flows are are no, 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 not, oh, sorry. not Bartholomew and Google Lab. Ah, uh, they talked about orbit equivalence. Yeah, I think they also assume some trans transitivity. Yeah. Yeah. I well, so. I mean, if you have just a general orbit equivalence, then I mean, it, it's hard. But if yeah. you bring in and by the time Google up, they had for homotopic orbit equivalence, homotopic, they didn't. I think they're, those are pretty rare. Uh, yeah, I, I don't exactly remember what, what they proved. Uh, yeah, I think that you don't have them unless the flows are covered. Uh -huh. I see. They're going to be trivial. I mean, they're just going to be sort of flowing along the flow lines, that sort of thing. Okay, I see. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll look at the, at the Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Bartelli man result is way harder. Yeah. Yeah. All right, why don't we call it there? We can talk after. Uh, sure. Great. So uh, let's thank the speaker again.